Hello, uh, hello, welcome uh, to this first uh, RRI ICT event at EMAL uh, for, for this year. Uh, so this is uh, a special art and science event also. And um, indeed, Anthony will say a few words about uh, the RRI ICT uh, European project. The role of EMAL here is to bring uh, a dialogue between artists and scientists, and also, when I say scientists, um, from exact science, science as well as uh, social science and humanities. Uh, so this is why we organize this uh, first event. And in principle, we will do it next year and also in 2000. Uh, 17. Now, uh, before going to um, the presentation and the debate, which will be moderated by uh, Bram Krivitz, uh, a few words to Anthony Dupont, who is the project manager of the RRI ICT um, project um, and who's working uh, at uh, Sigma Onioris, the, the lead partner of the European project. Anthony? Hello, good morning. Thanks for being here. Why are we here today? Well, um, it all comes from a simple uh, statement. is the realization that ICT, digital technologies, have huge and pervasive effects on, on our lives, on our society. OK, this is really simple, but what does it mean? It means that maybe the people who develop those technology, the researchers, the innovators, that put those technology onto the market, they must have a responsibility to the rest of society, have their technologies having so much consequences on the way we live. If they have a responsibility, then we must find ways to build bridges between this world of technology research and development and the rest of society. Who is best able to voice the needs of society, the expectations, the fears, the concerns, the values of society to researchers? Well, we have a number of options for this, but we believe that artists have a key role to play in stating what society expects from technology how society can cope with the pervasive effects and the profound changes that technology has on our lives. Another bridge that can be built is also through social sciences and humanities. People who can help us understand what do those technology changes mean for us as people, as human beings, as groups, as families, as society as a well. whole. So our project is about linking ICT technology and ICT development to the rest of society. And for this, we believe in the role of artists, philosophers, social science experts. Our objective is to make research and innovation more responsible, and that's what this acronym means, Responsible Research and Innovation. And the way to do that is to start a dialogue between society and people who can represent it um, with ICT technologies. This is what we'll be doing and discussing this afternoon. And um, I will let um, the moderator, Mr. Uh, Kravitz, to uh, start the discussion. Thank you for being here. Enjoy the day. Um, I can express a, a warm welcome on behalf of EMAL uh, to all of you. Um, we will start with the first presentation of Mark Kukelberg. Um, we have a fully packed afternoon. Um, so we have seven presentations in only four hours and a half. 
uh, including a debate. So uh, this will be um, at, at, the, at least a very fast pace uh, for all of us. So we will keep it quite strict. So each speaker has 20 minutes. After each uh, presentation, we only allow for five minutes of question and Q&A. Uh, so that will mean one or two maximum questions uh, for each. If you have another question, uh, please save it to the debate. So we can we have one hour, 45 minutes at the end of the afternoon for the for a debate. Um, Mark Kukelberg is, is a professor at uh, the Montfort University in uh, the UK, uh, where he's uh, doing research um, on uh, social responsibility and technology uh, at the Center for Computing and Social Responsibility. He's also the co-chair of the IEEE uh, Robotics and Automation Society Technical Committee on Robot Ethics, um, and he has been uh, published um, quite, intense, quite intensively on this, on this subject matter. So he will give us an introduction to um, responsibility or the notion of responsibility in ICT research and innovation for you. Okay, thank you, Bram, for the introduction. Um, good afternoon. Um, yes, let me start with, um, with thanking also Aymal and, uh, and the people of the project to invite me here. I'll, um, let me say first something about um, what I'm doing. I'm a, a philosopher of technology, so I think about new technologies and, um, and what might be ethical and social uh, aspects of these, these technologies, in particular robotics and automation. And uh, part of that work also involved thinking about responsible innovation in that area, uh, and, and particularly also at the center where I'm uh, currently located. So what I want to do is, uh, in my presentation, which uh, will be uh, opened right now, um, I will, uh, what I want to do is reflect a little bit on uh, responsible innovation and its link to, um, to um, art, artistic practice. Um, because I think it was, will, might be relevant uh, to the project and to, uh, to the center. Um, so, okay, thank you very much. Um, so, let me start with that. Um, so, if, if I um, Say responsible innovation. I think there uh, there are various levels uh, where we can uh, discuss this question. Um, one is, of course, society as a whole, and in uh, the area of robotics, one of the uh, and automation, one of the problems is um, if we have these robots, what will happen to uh, employment? Um, are uh, some people say the, the robots going to take over, and will there not be no place for us anymore? Not only for people working in factories, but also for maybe even creative people. Um, are algorithms going to do our work? Um, there are also uh, discussions about robotics and automation in healthcare. Uh, should we have robotic nurses? Uh, should we um, um, have robots uh, to give to elderly people so, uh, so humans can do other things? So there are some questions at that level. Uh, we can also look at organizations and uh, how they run and how, to, how they can, for example, involve stakeholders. And then the micro level, uh, which I call it, is uh, about, for me then, about human-robot interaction. Uh, is how, how do people interact with the robots and what are, could be ethical problems there? For example, in healthcare, is it, um, is it fine to just have, uh, have a machine care for people or should we keep in the humans? Um, or are there, is there another solution uh, or are there other possibilities maybe we don't think about? Um, it is a matter of deception to, um, to give um, a very uh, kind of cute robot to an elderly person uh, pre uh, pretending that it's, uh, that it's an animal, um, a pet animal, um, whereas it's not. Um, or is it maybe no problem? Um, so th these are kind of questions I ask. Um, and I'm asking these questions as a philosopher, but I, at the same time I try to, to look what's happening in labs, and not only from the outside, but also by being involved in projects. This is a technical project called DREAM, um, which is um, a project that develops robots for therapy for children with ASD, uh, Autism Spectrum Disorder. And 
in a, in a project, uh, but the, the aim of the project is to develop these more autonomous robots um, to, to give to children and therapists to conduct therapy. And of course, then there, there are these kind of micro issues uh, definitely uh, that have to do with the interaction. Um, so, uh, micro uh, issues like um, do parents actually trust their children in the hands of these robots, um, or the, the, would they prefer only human therapists? Um, and we can also ask responsible innovation questions. And um, in this case, there was a, um, a Eurobarometer result a couple of years ago, which said that people were quite opposed to robots in healthcare. So we did a, a survey to, to see what they would think of these robots for um, autism therapy. Um, luckily for the technical researchers, it was more uh, positive than the Eurobarometer. Um, but still, it's, it's good to then, then see what exactly could be issues. For example, people wanted, um, were fine with the robot in general, but they didn't want that uh, the robot would be um, very autonomous. So they, they wanted um, what we call in the project supervised autonomy, um, where the, the therapist is still supervising the robot. Um, so this is an example of how, uh, about these issues about the interaction. Uh, but also more generally, how do we involve stakeholders in, in bigger projects like this? Um, how to involve parents uh, and therapists in this? Um, so that, that's something to, to further think about because a survey has its limitations. You, you ask people, but you don't have these longer um, interviews, for example. So there are various ways of doing that. Um, then, um, let me... Yes, so um, what, uh, something else I should uh, say about this project is um, what I like about it is that um, the, the, the ethics is part of the project, so often uh, ethics is seen as something that should be on the, the ethical board or something, um, something outside, or it's assessed afterwards or um, at, at a stage when the proposal is accepted by external experts. Um, I'm also doing that, but this interesting here is that the, the, the idea was to integrate the, the ethics and the responsible innovation within the, uh, the project. So it has its own work package and that there's more of that happening now. Um, so that's kind of, you could say, responsible innovation in practice, how, how to do that. And uh, I think there's still a lot to, to, to learn there. Um, and I, I know that many other projects and many other experiences so I think uh, it's, good, it's good to bring that together. Um, what I also do is I think about uh, not only about responsible innovation, but also what, what innovation is and what, what this kind of practice is, because uh, this is often a, a side of the, the phrase that's, uh, that's less reflected upon. Um, what, what I like about um, bringing in artistic practice is that we can also have uh, what I would call different ways of knowing. Um, if we call, look at um, what engineers do, um, I think the, the kind of knowing that's happening there is, um, is only partly a knowing that, where you just need to, you know, need to know some facts and figures, you need to um, uh, know some, um, uh, uh, some knowledge in the background. But what, what's happening there is, uh, is know-how. And the, the way um, know-how works, I think, is not that you don't only start from, um, from an ID which you then implement. Of course, that's, that's part of what you're doing. Um, but um, I think there are also a lot of um, unexpected things. And the, the way I conceptualize is that by using Heidegger to, to say like, well, there are also things that are revealed in the process. So then uh, the, the knowledge that's, that's gained um, uh, is, is not so much at a theoretical level, but it's more practical and is also not fully under control. Um, and this kind, this side of engineering and design, um, you could say, is, is similar to uh, to also part of what happens in artistic practice. Um, and you can tell me more about it, uh, what you think about it. But I see a lot of parallels there that that you have these different 
uh, knowledge, um, what Heidegger would call a, a kind of poetics. And uh, th this is, I find, very interesting because I think, um, uh, of course, we should try to make innovation responsible to the outside in the sense of involving people, but we should also look at w what is this innovation itself and can we um, can we maybe also not only include more people, but also include more different ways of looking at a matter um, and, uh, and thinking about something. And uh, so these different kinds of knowledge, different ways of thinking uh, is something that, uh, that art uh, can, uh, can contribute. Um, so, uh, for, for example, um, I looked at, uh, at, at the robots and uh, I saw in, in labs how robots are developed and, um, and it's very much, it's, it's more like um, uh, tinkering, bricolage in French, and, 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 and maybe less than just starting from this very abstract concept. Um, of course, there is mathematics going into that and formalization of knowledge, but uh, there's, there's a lot of trying out things. So if we then look at um, responsible innovation, we could say that, yeah, let's, uh, let's see how to, we can bring different ways of seeing, experiencing, and doing into that process of innovation. Um, and maybe the quality of the innovation will, will be better, um, also in, in social ways. Um, and, and not only think about uh, how to draw in different people and views. Um, the way I um, explore this is through, um, at the moment, is, is talking to uh, dancers and choreographers and to see how they, their artistic practice um, could teach us something about uh, different ways of, of doing things. Um, and um, let me give some, some examples of questions I asked. There are philosophical questions. You could say uh, things like, can, can a machine feel pain? And what's the distinction between uh, humans and machines? Does this distinction matter at all? And um, how, how do these dancers experience a robot, for example, when the robot is on stage? Um, and what does this tell us about technology that uh, also moves? And what does it tell us about uh, moving with technology? Um, so I'm more interested in the, in the, um, in the uh, moving um, aspect here. Um, let me just quickly uh, show two things, um, just uh, two minutes. One uh, is a work by uh, Thomas Freundlich. Um, I don't know if the the sound is here, but um, I can I can just play a, a half a minute uh, or even a few seconds. Here in this uh, work, the uh, the dancer um, dances with a robot, and the robot is an industrial robot, so it's not a humanoid robot, which most people imagine when they think about dancing with robots. But it's, it's, it's um, um, you see it in the background, it's like two industrial robots, very, uh, very machine-like, you could say. But still, uh, when people see this, uh, they tend to um, see the movements of the robots as uh, quite human-like, and they respond to it in that way. So that I find interesting, how do people experience that, both as the dancer, um, but, but also as the, as the audience, of course. So that's just uh, one, um, one example. Oh, let me see where the presentation is. Yes. Um, I will give uh, one more example. This is um, work by Louis Philippe Demers, um, La Cour des Miracles. It's also um, art with robots, and in this case, um, it's, um, among other things, robots that are in, uh, uh, in pain, or at least um, that, that appear uh, to be in pain. Um, let me move this to the middle so you have an uh, impression of that. Um, so uh, people, it, it's, it's just, again, it's just a machine and I exp explicitly uh, chose these examples um, because, because they're not, not humanoid robots because there you could say it's easy to see um, a kind of human being in that. 
but it's 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 metal things, right? But they move and they move in specific ways. Um, here, for example, uh, a limping machine, um, and uh, which refers to this area in Paris, a historical area where people would. Uh, La Cour de, de Miracle, where people would fake uh, disabilities. But it's, for me, it's, what's interesting is that people ascribe all these meanings to, uh, to the machine. Um, from one side, uh, scientists may come in and just say, well, this is just a machine, but people look at it in different ways. So um, I find it interesting to see how, how people respond to this, um, these, these machines. Okay. Um, so let me see. Yeah. So for example, here the um, uh, Louis Philippe de Mers calls these these um, machines animats, like animal, but then machines, automats. Right? So uh, here, this kind of the border machine animal is maybe not so clear as we we think. Uh, or is in any case questioned, and, um, and apparently we, we use our empathy when, when we see these machines. So I uh, summarize this as pain is in the body of the beholder, because you're, you're perceiving that as a human embodied being, as a moving being, as an empathic being. Um, so it's a lot about what's, what's in the human, of course, um, what, what this object is doing to us. Um, and in that way, it appears in, in different ways. So to conclude, um, uh, there are these different approaches to responsible innovation. Um, I'm also interested in what innovation is, and, and uh, we could talk about what that means for, uh, for responsible innovation, uh, because apparently people have all these very different perceptions of technology, um, and I think art can really uh, yeah, bring in these different ways of seeing, also can reveal um, uh, these this different, uh, different ways people experience technology. Um, and I think that's a very important role uh, next to, of, of, of course, uh, asking people what they think. Because it's, it's not only about what people think, not only about what people, their opinion people have, but also how they feel, perceive, uh, and directly experience the technology. Um, so let's re respond to, to voices of stakeholders, but um, there's not only the voice as a body, there's everything. Um, uh, let's, let's bring in these new ways of, uh, or, or these alternative uh, kinds of knowledge and, and, uh, and also shape more meeting points like this center where uh, these different kinds of knowledge and these different practices, technological uh, art, uh, and so on, where they can meet, uh, and I think it's in this meeting point uh, that that unexpected things can happen, and we need more unexpected things, also even in European projects, perhaps. So that's my talk. One or two questions. Hello. I'm not sure. Do you know the uh, cinema film um, Transformers? Dressformers? Transformers. Transformers. Yes. yes, you know where the robots can change into Oh, yes, car. Transformers. Yes, yes. <laughs> because, okay. you know, yeah. I mean, when you say the robot is here in pain, I, yeah. ca I can't agree it. But, you know, I have to mm. watch the Transformers with my nephews. And they mm -hmm. have, like, you know, human faces. And, you know, and they fight and they cry. and they're why they cry, they don't have feelings. Yeah. But I really see how my nephews are into these things. So my question is, what do you think about this? Mm -hmm. When in a cinema film, the hero is not a human, it's actually a car machine, it looks like human. Yes. <clears throat> yes, thank you for that. Um, yes, that's, um, that's, that's interesting because the, just because the appearance changed, apparently um, the... Um, <coughs> We, we think it's a, a, it's a very different um, kind of entity. 
Um, and uh, I'm interested in that because it shows that the, the ontological status of, of objects is not as stable as we think. Um, it depends a lot on our perception, on, uh, on our experience. Um, and in this case, a transformer is a kind of uh, almost a metaphor of that. It's, uh, it's, it's uh, something changes from uh, a living human being to um, a living machine, you could say. Or, uh, and, and so um, th there are many more instances of that, I think. Um, and at, um, often this is kind of, uh, it's said like, oh, you know, it's like t children, you know, think like that. But I think um, a adults, they, they also do, do that. We just have learned to suppress it, but maybe we have these animistic tendencies and we have all kind of, uh, there's all kind of psychological things going on. And um, so uh, I think if we, if, we, if we always immediately close down uh, the, the door, you know, we can't continue the inquiry about, uh, about the ontology of objects. So I think it's, um, it's good to, to discuss this kind of examples. Thank you. Well, of course, um, my, my solution was then, you know, when you would, but when you want that you accept Dropbox more, you know, when you say people, does people, parents trust uh, Dropbox to their children, I think they should look very familiar to us, you know. I think because the point is by Transformers, they really look humans. Mm -hmm. One looks like a dwarf, another one looks like a cowboy, and yeah. you know, another one looks like a samurai, and, and this helps us. Well, this is a machine, but actually mm -hmm. the first kind I see a person which is familiar to me, Yes. and then it, I, I'm willing to accept it more. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. So sometimes, by the way, technology, uh, it, it, um, it's said like, like humanoid robots, they evoke more of the ethical discussion. So some people say well, we should not make them into human form, right? Because then you don't have the controversy. But I, I don't know if we should not have controversy. Thank you. Yeah. Um, thank you very much for the presentation. It was very interesting indeed. I would actually like to raise the issue of acceptability of technology. And I think ethics is a very important factor here. So, uh, are Europeans generally more skeptical, skeptical of new technologies than the others? For example, you have talk, talked about um, robots in, applied for healthcare, but we know that in Japan there is much more interest in this kind of research and innovation. So, can you maybe say a few words about cultural differences and maybe with implications on ethics and acceptability of technology? Thank yeah. you. Thank you for this question. Yes, because I start from the phenomenology of robots. That means for me how they how they appear to us, and and what's already there in a way that makes them appear, and what's already there, the the, the conditions. Part of that is is our culture. We already have ways of of seeing things, and it is true that uh, that Japanese people look at this differently than than in the West, for example. Um, uh, like w when I was there, like pe people asked me, like, why do do you uh, find it so important to ask a question about the difference between humans and robots? Um, I or we don't find that so important. This this you know ontological difference. Um, may maybe there's more. They're more similar, uh, and so. Uh, of course, it is in partly to do with, with cultural differences, and um, so it's, it's important uh, to, to take that into account. And I can imagine that uh, th there might be even differences within Europe uh, on, on several technologies. Um, and um, but but I would say, um, okay, acceptability from the point of view of people who want to push the technology, and it's a question of accept acceptability. But I think. Um, we should asking the question in this way, like should this technology be accepted, is um, is starting from one point of view only, and it, it's uh, not so much asking do we really need the technology or what is the technology going to do, or is is maybe excluding the kind of questions I just asked. So um, I think um, maybe the the ethics of robotics should go beyond acceptability. Um, but thanks for the question about culture. It's a great question. Okay, uh, thank you, Mark. Um, Google back.